If you've been here any time, any length, it's our anniversary, and I got my lunch. I'm going to roll this bad boy. It's my second piece of luggage because the other one is gone. <laughs> it's been through so much tough stuff and turmoil. But you know what it symbolizes is the journey. The journey. We've been on a journey together. Some of us for a long time, some of us for a short time, and most of us in between. But by genius, we've been on it together. Do I have an amen? Amen. And when we think about happy birthday, happy birthday, Genesis Fellowship. Happy birthday. Now, if you've noticed the number on that screen, there's a whole bunch of them. We have become, oh my gosh, a teenager. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. Because sometimes when they get to be 13, and I'm speaking about just individuals, they think that they know everything there is to know and that they own the world. Now, mamas and dads, do I have an amen on that? Amen. I, I hope we're not there because we don't know diddly. Amen. We don't know enough to go, amen. <laughs> okay, that's a whole bunch of amens over there. You know, we continue to journey together. And at 13, well, let's not think that we know everything. Well, let's not think that we can do whatever we want to do without consulting God. Well, let's remember that we are still underneath His guiding power and the Spirit of God that resides in us. So as we go and as we think, and we understand journey, because that's what this symbolizes, and you know that, we're still walking hand in hand together. You see, in those 13 years, we've done the good, we've done the bad, trust me, we've done the ugly too, and we really have. We have seen a lot of changes in our culture, and we have done a lot of ministry in our society. It has been both the best thing which I have ever been involved in, and absolutely the hardest ministry which I have been a part of. But together, we have stood at the bottom of the mountain and we have looked up and we've wondered, can we attain? Can we climb? Can we make it all the way to get to there? The answer is yes. But we can't do it alone. Number one, we have to have God. And number two, as a church, we have to have each other. You say, we need to climb up and ask God to take our hand, and as He's pulling us up, we grab each other's hand. And so that there is a little train that's going up, and if I may use a title of another little children's book, A Little Train That Kid. And we'll make it to the top together. <clears throat> we can accomplish the ministry mission which God has called us to, but we must stay focused. For those of you who have journeyed all of the 13 years together, I say thank you. For you that have been here for 7 to 12 years, I say thank you. For you that have been here for this past Sunday to six years, I say thank you. And guess what? We are a family of God. Amen. And we meet inside of a building. And God has labeled us Genesis Fellowship. And we aren't finished yet. Let's pray to God. God, you're just flat out awesome. To think, to think back, to think about today, and to think about the future, you are in control. Just teach us today, and we'll learn. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. 
Jeremiah 29, 11. You've only seen it 7,222 times in 13 years. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in the future. You see, if there was anything that got us started and we used Scripture, this was it. We, we rallied around this. For in that beginning, the only thing that we had was God and each other. Nineteen people. And that was it. And if you look at that, and you think about it. See, when you're asked by God to plant, to begin a new ministry, you need Scripture to lead the way. And this was one of them. So look at it. For I know the plans I have for you. Even before He put it in our hearts to do what He had called us to do, He already knew that 13 years later we'd be right here. <laughs> That's what I find is so cool about God. He already knew. He knew what songs you would pick out today. He knew that we would have visitors. He knew that old folks would be here. <laughs> he knew everything that's going on. I have the plans. I know the plan. I have for you. God says he has plans for us. It's not Mark Gerald plans or Randy Norman's plans or Bob Coster's plans because they were there at the beginning. And now it, it's not Bill Bowen plans or Rick Baxter's plans. Herb Farley, Bruce Bosley, it's not your plan. It's God's plans. Do I have an amen on that? Because if we start doing our own, then we will fail. We will fail. I have a plan. Declares the Lord. He didn't just say it. He declared it. Now, you're saying, okay, Mark, this is Old Testament and Jeremiah, and he's talking about, uh, you know, all that in Israel. And I, I'm saying, can we not take God's word and apply it to our lives? Absolutely. That's how we live our lives. He's declared that he knew what was going to happen with Genesis Fellowship. He declared 13, really, and a half years ago, because we were half a year in my house. And then on Sunday morning, we would go to different churches together to check out the style of worship, to see if that's what we wanted to put together. And, you know, so he declared that. And then he says this, I declare this, plans to prosper you. Plans to prosper. Has he done that? Has he done that, uh, Laura Gardner? Has he prospered Genesis Fellowship, Miss Treasurer? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. She just smiled and shaking her head up and down. Now, do we have $9 million in the bank? No, we don't. If you have $9 million and want to give it to Genesis Fellowship, <laughs> it would be gladly received, okay? But, you know, are we doing okay? Yeah, we are. Can we do better? Yes, we can. But you know what? Plans to prosper us, he has, and he's going to continue that. And not to harm us. Sometimes he takes things out of our way not to harm us, and he has done that. And guess what? He is giving us plans for hope and the future. Do you think that we're finished? No. Do you think that in 13 years, in this building that we've been in in a year and a half, and, and the things that we're doing, and, and um, you know all the work that we've done, that we're finished? Oh my gosh, no. Do you think that there's people in your workplace that need to hear Jesus Christ? And that they need a whole <coughs> church? Absolutely. Folks, we're not finished. We're not even starting to think about being finished. Home. So he's got plans to give us a hope and a future. And when you add all of that up, oh my goodness gracious, it is everything that we wrapped our arms around, wasn't it? Lisa, wasn't it? In fact, that, her name wasn't even Lisa Norman when she started with us. It was Lisa Ray. We went to their wedding. I mean, it's that thought process of the few that began. And, and here they are. So let's take a few seconds and just look back. And I'm just talking about for a second because I want you to understand where it came from. For many of you all, I know that you've heard this already, but we have so many new people. Please listen. The call. Here's the deal. I was a youth minister at another church. And I resigned. If you want to know why I resigned, you just ask me sometime. I'd be glad to detail it for you. And I resigned with absolutely no idea what was going to happen next. <clears throat> a minister fills out a profile in the ABC USA. And we send it in to the home office. And you indicate what state you want your profile 
to be, um, I don't know what the term is, ignited or started or opened so that churches that are looking for pastors, they would receive it. I'm a youth minister and we rocked it, that church and we had, you know, 65 students and it was just fantastic and we did a lot of great stuff. And you know what? Hey, nobody heard of me. Hey, nobody heard of me. So I'm sitting there and we send it out to Ohio, Kentucky, North Carolina. You know, I'm thinking, phew, this is a snap. One month goes by, true story. Two months goes by, not a phone call. Three months goes by, I'm starting to worry a little bit here now. Four months go by, and I now, Cindy and I are like, we're, macaroni and cheese is our main meal. And, and it's just, I'm, I'm, wow, this is really happening. We had no response. See, our thought process that was that we could live in our house and because we were so known in the Canal Valley, <laughs> that there'd be a church in the Canal Valley that would want us. And so, we don't need to sell our house. We don't need to leave the house. We, this is a house. It's our house. And uh, got a lot of history in that house. And after four and a half months, we're sitting on our couch. And we're crying our eyes out. Frankly, I'm thinking that I'm not supposed to be in ministry anymore. It's just nothing happening. And it was that day that Cindy and I, holding hands together, pleading to God, <clears throat> broke the barrier. And we said, we will sell our house and move to anywhere you want us to go. True story. I'm not adding anything or making anything up. When we prayed that prayer, two days later I get a phone call from Max Hill. You all know Max Hill, very minister. And he comes at me with a totally different aspect or thought process and he said, Mark, uh, you ever thought about planting a new church? Well, in seminary, you know, we went through it and had a couple guys from Illinois who were in our class that were new planters, new church planters. I didn't want anything to do with it. I wanted out. No way. I'm serious. There was nothing that I saw in that that made me go, yeah, that's great. But this time when Max presented it, and then he mentioned a guy by the name of Jack Eads, who's in the WVBC, and he said, I need you and Jack to get together. You see, there was a new program that the WVBC had just started about a, a year or so or two before, and it was called 30 by 2010. And that was 30 new church plants in the state of West Virginia by 2010. So I met with him. And folks, I want to tell you that the doors flew open. They just flew open. It was like Cindy and I grabbed God's hand, held each other's, and everything started happening right. It didn't matter. We had to get funding from local churches. We went to churches. They funded us. I mean, I, we were funded in Beckley and in Bluefield. and I mean, guys and gals, I didn't even know. We went and presented what the thought process was, so on and so forth, and it just happened. But they had to send us to Green Lake, Wisconsin. And it was to a, a week-long test. It was for couples who were going to be new church planters throughout the nation, not just at WVBC. And to be honest with you, um, it was without a doubt, well, it was, called, it was called red light, green light. You either were going to pass and get a green light, or they're going to say, not right now. Out of the 11 couples that were there, we were psychologically tested. I found out I did have a brain. Uh, it was small. It was small, very small. Cindy had a big one. She had a big brain. And they tested her alone, me alone, us together. I had to preach. We had to come up with, I mean, it was intense, to say the very least. And at the end, we got a green light. There were only three couples out of the 11 that did. And from that point, God had us moving. And so the beginning began. We acknowledged God, not knowing where we were going to plant. But we started inside of my, my house. And some of the people that I've mentioned were there. And Jack Eads was the leader for our first home group. And Lucky Ray uh, from the Canal Valley Association was there and it began. And I want to tell you, the excitement level was, was out the door. To think that you don't know what God wants you to do, have a 
figured out how we're going to do worship. Absolutely don't even know what city we're going to be in. But we know that it's going to be somewhere local. It might be Taze Valley. It might be Sissonville. It might be North Charleston. It might be Cross Lanes. And that's what happened. And we began. And then we wrapped ourselves around a scripture that I had preached on a minimum of twice a year. Acts chapter 2. Verses 42 through 47. It says this. And they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We took that and we ran with it. We devoted ourselves to teaching. We devoted ourselves to caring for one another. I truly believe that the DNA of Genesis Fellowship that we have today, it had to have started from that home group. It had to. Many of the people that were there in that first going, guess what? They're still here. And with that, everything that we believed, everything that God wanted us to uh, take and to further, it began right there. So the, the fellowshipping, to the breaking of bread, to caring about one another, to prayer. Prayer is essential in our, in our ministry today as it was back then. And we were together. And we cared about one another. I mentioned that we went to Randy and Lisa's wedding. I think one of the biggest surprises in our early years, Randy was big time in running. He still runs quite a bit. But he was running in the Charleston distance run. And this was very early in our together. Didn't know him very well. But Cindy and I decided to surprise him. And we went up on the boulevard and waited until he ran by. And the only thing we did was say, go get him, Randy. You look like crap. You know? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I said, go get him, Randy. You're doing great. And he went. <coughs> My point in saying that, we wanted him to understand. And that's, that's the beginning. So the first that happened, first place of worship, you all know, is Andrew Jackson Middle School. And our first worship service literally was October the 4th, 2004. And I went back into our books, our history books, because I keep a bunch of stuff. Had 65 people in attendance. Now think about that. We started with 19, had 65. That's because we begged every brother, sister, aunt, uncle, granny, grandma. I, we went out on the street corner, pulled people in. We had people. Friends were there, and it was fantastic, and it was great. And I told you the other day, that the first worship service, we had 127 songs. It was 9 million hours long. It was a trip, man. Why anybody came by, I had no idea. If they liked singing, it was great. If they, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was a long thing. But the first also began. Our first vendor fair was the Saturday before we opened on Sunday at Andrew Jackson Middle School. We were part of a community event. The first, we got involved with a fellowship of Christian athletes there. We, we had our first teacher's appreciation luncheon there. And we had our first baptism at Tower Mountain Baptist Church. And you know who the first person that was baptized underneath Genesis Fellowship's umbrella? Bruce Jackson. He was baptized on October 24, 2004. We had our first church dinner, and it was a Christmas dinner. The first time we were ever over 100 in attendance was Open Arm Sunday that next year. And we had 101. We had our first youth Sunday. And there was two youth in our youth <laughs> ministry. And we had our first picnic. Again, DNA started. DNA moving forward. And then six years later, we had to move. We moved from the YMCA, from the AJ, Andrew Jackson Middle School, to the YMCA. And some other firsts there, we had to buy chairs. The ones that, especially... These groups that are sitting in, those are the ones that we bought. And we had to buy more sound equipment, video, uh, video equipment, and, and the term set up, take down. Set up, take down. Set up, take down. Started to become a part of who we were. I will say this, I've got to say it because we laughed about it earlier this week. Roy Edens, the chair Nazi. <laughs> Do y'all remember? I mean, that, I, that, that's, not, that's not in line, Mark. That's not in line. Move it up. 
I said, how far? He said, oh, about half an inch. <laughs> God bless him. I mean, those are funny. And it was that type of stuff. Set up and take down, and we continued to grow. And we really and truly did. And then the first continue, we bought this building and we worked. And many of you all were here. December of 2015, we bought our building. Five and a half months of work, and I know that you know this, but let's go with me. Happy birthday, the 13th year, five and a half months of work, 129 gallons of paint. You name it, we did it. Remember when we, the, the building team first came in, we, we saw cat poop everywhere. We saw dead birds all over the place. We saw a, a place that was in shambles, and uh, but again, it wasn't our vision, it was God's, right? And we came into this building, I mean this portion of the building. Remember the tile floors? Remember the stage that was more up and out and the half wall and no baptistry? And, but we looked and the building team got excited. I could see the excitement. And it was like, Dominoes started to fall and the snowball started running down the hill because they saw, oh my gosh, the possibilities. Now remember, the towel had asbestos. <laughs> remember? And it was all broken up. I mean, guys, remember back when you first saw it. And yet God had a vision. And in that vision, he saw you sitting here with six televisions looking at you, electronics and new sound. Thank God for Cody Jeffries and everything that he knows and for Rusty Fogarty and everything that he's done. And we come in here. Now, we still have saints that make no sense to us because we're Baptists. St. <laughs> Patrick and St. Martin and St. Francis and St. Bernard. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm reading them right now. And there's St. Donald. So, I just thought, well, go over here and just hush, you know. Did you hear what he said? He said, St. Albans? <laughs> there is one, St. Albans. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But, you know, we looked at it and there was a vision, there was a possibility, there was things that are happening. And, and my goodness, the fellowship was sweet. We got dirty together. The women, you're here, put your hand up. The women that were downstairs peeling off the pet wallpaper in the hallway. Look at, look, come on, you were one of them. Come on. I walked down there after that started. I walked down there one time, and Lisa Norman was at the end. And she was pulling and she went, oh, I'm with, this is her, she went. <laughs> I walked back and got the heck out of there. I, I literally went around. Came back down to the other side, and I said, Hey, women, that wallpaper's doing well. Keep going. You know, so, but it was all of that. We all pitched in. We had all types of stuff happening, but it was sweet fellowship as we worked together in a work of love, and God smiled, right? God smiled, God smiled. And then we had our first service, the dedication service, on May the 1st, 2016. It was awesome. It was awesome. Do you remember? It was just fantastic. And that's when Max Hill made his famous line. You people, y'all just ain't right. <laughs> and we, you know, we think about that. And then I, I've got to go one step further because on that day when we had 225 people here and it was a wonderful, wonderful day, we dedicated the building to God. I had to get up after all that wonderful service and right before we went in there to eat cake and everything, do you remember all the message I had to tell you? I had to say, it is great that all 225 of you are here. Our sewer system has backed up and you cannot use the bathroom. <laughs> there were people going like this. <laughs> and they ran the wind. They said, that's the truth. But we have repaired that. And we can think back at those things. You see those first, those things, everything that we're looking back pretty cool. But as we journey together, as we carry our luggage, as we hold each other's hand, we come to today. To today. Right now. And you know what?
God is still blessing Genesis Fellowship over and over again. And can you see his blessing? How about the 16 little ones that just went out the back door? Amen. Now, I want to tell you that doesn't happen in many churches our size. Amen. It doesn't. They can go to GFKZ and we've got wonderful teachers down there. They go to the nursery and we've got people that love them and love them and love them. How about the 15 to 20 youth at youth group every Wednesday? I say it. I'm not brown nosing you, so you just be quiet. I would pick Pastor Anthony Lucas as my youth minister over any body, man or woman, in the WVBC. Amen. I'm telling you that right now. We have been blessed with leadership down there. The team that's set up down there continues to do well. How about the six home groups up and running and the new GFFG group? They are rocking on Thursday night. They're averaging 11 or 12 every Thursday night. We even have a home group that now meets at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. And we have people who are coming to that that wouldn't come before because they couldn't go at evening. And those things are happening. And you know what? We're still doing what we're called to do. We've got a great building and a great location today. And it's coming together well right off the interstate. You all don't know we have many, many, many homeless people coming knocking on the doors now because we're in their circle. South Charleston Police Department has been talked to me many times. And you know what? We help some that we can ascertain really needs it. But we're right here. And see, off the interstate, I know this, that it takes... it. Bruce and Aaron Jackson, my daughter and son-in-law, and two grandkids, coming from Hurricane. It takes them less time to drive to our church now than it did for them to drive to Cross Lanes where we were located. It's a better move. It's right here. It's very visible. People know that we are here. And all the things which we get to get done are getting done. And thanks be to God. Our work party this Saturday is very important. It's very important. So I ask that you please consider coming. You might say, I can't do anything. We've got stuff that everybody can do. And it's, by the way, God is continuing to bless us. And you, even with all the improvements in this building, right, let's figure out just so that I, today, when we bought this building, it was $200,000, you all know this, and we bought it with what? Cash. And we owed zero. Then we had to put in this almost $15,000 heating and cooling system because we wanted more in here. We had some, we had a couple in our church that paid for it and we paid them back. It's, it's done months ago. And, and we think about the improvements that we've done, all the windows and all the other furnace things and the baptistry, I go on and on and on. There's been almost $93,000 worth of improvements in a year and a half. Hold on a second. Let me... Uh, Somebody got a phone with calculator. Get, get, get to me real quick. Calculator, phone, give me one. Calculator. Okay, hold on a second. Yep, I'm right. We owe zero. Oh. We owe zero. And there's not too many churches that can say that. My point is today, we're now a happy church family. It's a breath of fresh air in our congregation. We're happy to be together. We have the freedom to worship, freedom to raise our hand, freedom to clap, freedom to talk, freedom to do the things and to learn and to love. You know what? We can celebrate God, smile, and laugh. And the Holy Spirit encourages us to be loud and grateful that we are. I've talked about the home groups and the youth and the GF and all the groups are doing well. Could we do, be doing better? Absolutely, yes, we could. And we need to. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But we're still thinking outside of the box. Sunday morning worship at the levee. How many people like that? Give me a something. Give me something. That was fantastic. It truly was. I want to do that again. Leadership team, we haven't talked about it. We haven't made any decisions. I'd like to do that. sticking outside of the box. Matt Marvel, keep doing what you're doing. Unashamed home group. And that is our, college, our high school graduates and college age 
I want to tell you they meet everywhere, all over the valley. They're thinking outside of the box. One time they'll meet a Books of Million. The next time they'll meet a Panera Bread. Next time they'll be at Riding Iron Lake. Next time they'll be at, the, I don't know. They're all over the place. And folks, they're growing. They're growing. It's exciting. Matt, keep doing it. Keep teaching them Jesus. Keep teaching them Jesus. And keep expanding. That's thinking outside of the box. Who would have thought? I'm still on today. Who would have thought that 10 years later, I'm saying 10, not 30, 10 years later, that we're still doing archery camp. Not one single person has been stuck with an arrow. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the thing that is, this year, and you heard me talk about it before, two years ago, I went to the leadership team. It's over. It's done. Let's don't do it anymore. I won't tell you. They, yeah, we are. We're going to keep doing it. Okay. Go ahead, honey. I walked out there going, okay, we're going to have 32 people, and I know what's going to happen. Everybody's going to be happy, and they're going to be a bad at Mark. I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think I'm right. I know I'm right. I know I'm right. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. I'm right. They were right. <laughs> <laughs> and so with that in mind, you've got 117 shooters this year, and everybody say six. Six. That's how many people accepted Christ. Amen. You know what? I mean, this is what is thinking outside of the box. I don't know of any other, I've never heard of any other church in the WVBC, ABC USA, XYZD, UBD, OBD, I don't care. You put any letters out there, it goes to raffles off a rifle inside of a church. <laughs> I had a dude, I had a dude heard me talking to somebody about buying some tickets. And he was standing there and he said, excuse me. I said, yeah, I'm thinking he wants to buy some tickets. Okay? He said, now let me get this straight. You're, you're representing a church and you're raffling off a rifle. I said, yes, sir. He said, now who are you? I said, I'm the pastor. <laughs> he said, I have never heard that before in my life. Is it legal? <laughs> Yeah, it's legal. We haven't shot anybody yet. And you, we had a blast. And when we had the picnic, there were 62 people to pick that. We made $5,700. Thank you, gardeners, again. But my point is thinking outside of the box, because what have we done with that money? We haven't done anything with it except for all, we bought a brand new ice maker back there for all of our weddings, for all of our parties, for all of our birthday parties, for all of those things. Guess what? We have ice now. And we've got the other money that will, yeah. We've got the other money that will go and help us do the things that we're doing this Saturday. It's thinking outside of the box. And one last thing on thinking outside of the box. 724, Heather Leitner, she's not here. Two, not one, two vendor fairs this year. We've never had one. And they were a success. People had a blast. And they made money for the church. All the, most of the new chairs, I mean, so what are we doing? We're growing disciples and we're sharing Jesus and we're doing it like no other church in the valley. And people will say, oh, come on, man. Yeah, we're still doing things right. We've baptized eight already this year. We've had 11 people join the church, and that's good. And excitement is still growing as we share Jesus in numerous ways. And that's what it's about. So we're journeying together, and that today is right now, and it's important. But what about our future? What about it? <clears throat> We're going to continue to follow God no matter what. Amen? Amen. Amen? That's what it's about. No matter what, following God. Everyone is telling the church that the way we believe, church in general, is wrong. TV, print, radio, media, Hollywood, politics, tell us that how we think is all messed up. Social media screams long and loud that we don't have a clue. Well, today, right now, I yell back and say, oh, yes, we do. And we're going to talk about God. We do because we are living lives that are spiritually correct, morally straight, and led by God. So no matter what comes our way, and I figure that more negatives are going to be coming our way, more name calling will be coming, we must stay strong, 
We must be strong. We must join arm in arm for added strength. We will stand with God. Everybody say, with God. With God. Against abortion, homosexuality, pornography, same-sex marriage, drug use, alcohol abuse, just to name a few. If you don't understand where we are, what we stand for, then come and talk to me. Because I'll be glad. I'll say we're a transparent church. We are a scripturally based church. Christ-centered. And we're going to do the things that are right. So how do we do that? How are we going to move forward in the future? It's important, and it's on you. We have to grow deeper individually. You have to grow deeper. So now, I'm preaching on your feet. When was the last time you read the Bible? When was the last time you studied the book of Acts? When was the last time you read about Jesus? When was the last time that you went back to Genesis? When was the last time that you looked at Revelation? When was the last time that you looked at any of Paul's letters? When was the last time? When was the last time? When was the last time? Don't give me the stuff that, oh, we're too busy, i got 42 kids, all that type of crap. That's not crap, excuse me, wrong term. Like, because you are busy, but you're not too busy to take 10 minutes. I'm telling you, we need to be deeper individually because it equals out to be a stronger church. And when we are strong together, we are only as strong as what? Our weakest link, that chain that everybody talks about. And that is us also. That is us also. We've got to be about it. So how do we do it? 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So when you go back and you look at, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Now he's talking to you. He's talking to you individually, not the church. He's talking to you. I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope in the future. How do we do that? Right here. How about 2 Timothy 3.16? All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. This is so important. God wanted to put sirens as on it. Okay? <laughs> so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Oh no, that was cool. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Okay. So when we see these two, and I wanted them together, that's what you need to wrap around. I want you to make a note on your bulletin. Those two scriptures. When you start to think that it's not worthy of your time, right here it is. Do your best to show that you are approved to God. And the approval is here is that you're trying to understand, to work through, to learn this scripture stuff, this Jesus guy. The more we learn, the more you read, the deeper you will be. I guarantee it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've been a part of it. And the more that we cling to and study God's Word, the deeper our faith will be. So when the tough times come, and they are coming, my brother and my sister, they're coming. When we look at the Johnson family and the Edens clan, we've had some tough times lately. The great time was when they both died. That's the joy. It was all the hard here. Your faith is going to be tested. And you've got to be rock solid and withstand those things that are going to happen. We've got to quit relying on the society's assessment of what is right and wrong. True. We must always use God's word as a scale of moral correctness. And when we do that, we will never be wrong and we will always be strong. So we've got to love one another. How are we going to do that, church? Love one another. Love one another. Turn to the person to both sides and say, I love you. I love you. I love doing that. I, I see people going, I love you. And they're saying, I love you. And other people are going, I love you. <laughs> yeah, I love you. You know, here's the deal. John chapter 13, Jesus speaking. He says, a new command I give you, my brother, my sister, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, our future is going to be all wrapped around how we are working with our individual faith, expanding it to the church, and then expanding it outside of our walls. 
That's what it's all about. Those three things. If we take care of the first one, then I guarantee you, you're going to take care of the second one because you're going to love one another. Right here, brothers and sisters. And then we're going to have a desire to go outside. Folks, 2017 up to October the 1st has been Satan's attack on Genesis Fellowship. It has been, it has been tough. Tough. God had to make a stand and he did. Blessed subtraction. And Jesus had to assist many of us to withstand the fiery darts of the devil. And he did. And God proved once again that he's in total leadership and that all we need to do is follow him. And while we are following him, we must love one another and help each other and understand that we are stronger together than we are apart. So what? We need to rise up. We need to rise up and make a stand. We need to rise up and be strong. We need to rise up and be right here, right now, all the time. Isaiah 61, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. So get up and start doing God is all over you. So make something great happen for him through you. And how do you do that? You answer his call. You do. You answer his call. And this one is on you. It will be on you until the day you die. Are you answering the call of God? The way I look at it is that Genesis Fellowship is a puzzle. Each of us are pieces. And we need to be connected. But in the center of the puzzle is Jesus. And as that is laid out, we connect to Jesus. And every piece, when we answer the call, we slide in. And it's perfect. It fits. You don't have to take a hammer and try to pound it in. It just fits. So stand tall and accept the call on your life from God today. So I end with a thought process. Happy birthday to all of us. 13 years and a teenager. What do we do next? I know the plans I have for you to close the war. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope in the future. We follow God's call in our lives. We continue to grow deeper in His Word. We reach out to this dark and dying world. And, and guess what? We draw others to Jesus Christ. It is our pleasure, our joy, to assist men, women, teenagers, and kids in finding Jesus as their Savior and Lord. So, where are you? What do you need to do for God? What's His call upon your life? Are you answering it? Or are you sitting back and doing nothing? Happy birthday. Your suitcase. Your journey. If God was to open up what was inside of your suitcase, oh, did I say that this was your spiritual suitcase? And if He opened up what was inside of it, would there be anything? Or would it be full?